Um, Rupert is right that I, I, I've moved around quite a bit. I think I'm on my sixth or seventh or maybe eighth university, and I'm linked with many others in the UK um, and elsewhere as well. Um, and for the last, what now, for 12 years or so, I've been intimately linked with the European Commission in Brussels, first as chair of something called the um, European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, which I'll talk about. And then secondly, I was asked to chair this European Research Area Board, which I'll show you some of the uh, members of later on, which is the senior advisory board of the whole commission on research and how we should develop it within Europe and in the global context. But the title of this talk, uh, I can never quite remember what I, titles I've given to people, is called Riding the Wave. And the reason that this is in, I'm going to talk a lot about the impact of the deluge, or the tsunami as we call it, of scientific data and where it's coming from, and how it's going to influence how we do research in the future. And this come, comes about, and the reason I was asked to chair this particular group, which is the so-called high-level group on scientific data, I've yet to meet a low-level group yet, but we'll see how we get on there. But the, anyway, we, we chaired this. We've had great fun doing this because it was done in conjunction with DG Information Society in the Commission, who have a much better idea of how to treat people than the DG Research and Innovation. DG Research and Innovation put you in a windowless room in the middle of Brussels, which is grey at the best of times and is even greyer when you're in the room. But these guys had the right idea. They sent us to Mons to start with, where we sat in the collection of Henri de La Fontaine. And I bet none of you have ever heard of Henri de La Fontaine. Uh, well, neither did I, but he won the 1913 Nobel Peace, Peace Prize. And we were there with his collection of data on um, human rights, which was in hundreds of little card index files. And it was the same day that um, Obama was getting the Peace Prize in Oslo. So we were looking at it and we were sort of reflecting on what it used to be like. So that was great fun. And we then moved to a, a monastery outside of Barcelona, about 200 kilometers away, where they made their own wine and olive oil. That was more productive. Um, uh, and then we ended up in the... Um, uh, old uh, Royal Observatory, I'm not sure we call it Royal Observatory, the Paris Observatory, which was one of the oldest scientific institutes in Paris, and then back to Brussels again. Um, so that's where this all started, and I'll come on to this a little later on, because I want to look at the contextual basis of this, and this isn't moving on. Um, hang on, what are you doing here? Ah, we're off, we're off. And this is a context. So, so I'm going to look at the development of research and how I see it, the role of large research infrastructures, and don't get worried here, these are not mainly not physical ones, these are dispersed ones. The European and international dimension, and then I'm going to look at the recommendations from that report. And why did I end up as the chairman of that particular group? Well, I've sort of become a professional chairman, if nothing else, especially getting the Finns and the Bulgarians and the Greeks and the Irish all to work together is something I seem to be quite good at. Um, uh, I'm not sure it's a good attribute, but there we go. It's something that one has. The second thing, though, was that I, my son came to see me about two years ago and asked what it was like to do a PhD. So I told him what it was like in Cambridge when Rupert and I were there. Maybe it was different for Rupert, but I used to sort of stagger in. Uh, the definition of being late for work was when the coffee was cold in the tea room, but that was a... Um, but, uh, we turned up, did experiments, did our analysis, wrote up a paper and pushed off. It was very easy. It was all very much a linear organization. And then it suddenly dawned on me, whilst I was um, boring my son with this, that um, actually it was going to look nothing like that. Absolutely nothing like that. So I was asked to write a short paper on what I thought research in 2030 would look like. And the good thing about t the year 2030 in the European context is it's outside the political arena. Um, at the moment, we're having discussions within Europe about budgetary funding from 2014 to 2020. Anything you say about up to 2020 is political. If you're beyond that, you're apolitical. So you can see uh, it was a good time to look back. And I looked back and I wrote this article and eventually Microsoft published it in their Futures magazine and it was taken up by quite a lot of press. 
and they sort of rather liked it. So there we are. That's how we got into all of this. So watch out if your son or daughter comes to ask you about doing a PhD. Well, the key is the future isn't what it's going to be, what it used to be. It's an old phrase, but it's quite a nice one. It's going to, it's going to confront us in completely different ways. And the key for me is how do you empower the researchers, researchers of today to actually accept those challenges of the future? Because research is going to be increasingly global. And I asked this question, what can little Europe do? I got into big trouble for that. We're rather big, they said. We have 400 million people with 4,000 universities. I still say to them, what can you do with the growing, growing economies elsewhere? 400 million out of what will be 9 billion is small beer, guys. So how can we work more effectively together to make something happen? The other thing is that the grand challenges before us are immense. Not only do you have the tragic challenges like you had here of earthquakes uh, uh, and big uh, floods and things, but in 2050 it's predicted there will be this 9 billion people there. It's also predicted unless something happens, a third of them won't have access to drinking water. And they're just going to sit there, aren't they, and say, poor old us. No way. They're going to take up whatever way they can and actually make themselves... Uh, known and thought. And we, in London, just a few weeks ago, or well, last week, I guess it was, we saw some of the outcomes of people who are disenfranchised from their society. And it will grow. It will grow. It's no good uh, um, just saying it will go away, because it will grow if we go on at the present rate. We haven't got enough energy. We haven't got enough resources. We're seeing increasing uh, activities of pandemics that sweep across whole continents. We've got to do something about this, and we've got to do it together. And burying your heads in the sand is no option. You've got to do something, and this is where a united group like European, 27 member states plus the associated states alongside, has to do something. There still needs to be the, the root of bottom-up ideas, and you'll all be sitting there saying, there's nothing to do with me, I've got my little idea. Good for you. Stand aside, please, so that others can get on too and actually solve what the world problems are about. The challenges are so immense, we cannot afford everybody just to do their own thing anymore. And I, I get into trouble again for saying, is the idea of the conventional PhD past its sell-by date? The PhD is only 100 years old in the UK, and I don't know how old it is here. It's got to morph into what we need in the future. And it's not just about depth, which we desperately need. People have to be di uh, discipline-based, know where their limits are, but also to look at cross as how they take part in international teams. And how we manage this and take it forward is going to be crucial. And we'll start to see that the role of e-science, and that's why this report becomes very important, becomes more and more vital. So, upcoming issues. Globalization, impact of research, the need to deliver solutions, not just little bits of solutions that nobody can knit together, and the impact of large research infrastructures and how we manage them. And the question for me is, where does a student sit in all of this? Little old me doing our thing. How do they actually take part? in it. And if you actually look at that report, you'll see some scenarios. And I was actually asked to say, no, it's not your son that asking you what a PhD looks like, it's your grandson in 2050 now asking you what it looks like. And so you can see what our scenarios we looked, uh, took, uh, took forward. And where is creativity in this particular context of global research? Well, this is the organization I, I used to uh, run. Uh, well, one of the laboratories is where my main office was, and if you don't know anything about physical sciences, this is the UK's um, there's a point work here. Uh, um, uh, physical sciences main laboratory, the Rutherford Appleton laboratory, about 12 miles outside Oxford. And at the top there, you see the UK synchrotron, um, uh, costing in UK money uh, a quarter of a billion pounds to build. Um, and uh, it's now fully operating. In fact, it's gone up to 500 million pounds uh, because it's fully uh, functioning. Uh, down the bottom here with the blue car bunker on here was the most powerful neutron source in the world. In the middle there, we had the two most powerful lasers in the world. We had over on the right here, Space uh, Technology Department with 220 instruments in space. And that dish was doing the tracking for NASA. And right in the middle there, you can't see them, well, you can't see anybody anyway, um, it, it is the particle physics group running CERN and a whole load of experiments down mountains in Japan and Italy and, and, and anywhere they wanted to be, really, um, and Palo Alto uh, or Stanford, and so on. 
But the key is, the, and I can't point it out to you, is at the top. Hmm? Is there a pound here somewhere? There's a stick here. Easy, isn't it? That one up there is the data store, which is the largest civilian data store in the UK. Uh, uh, civilian, by the way, not, uh, not defence. And uh, that was the key to the whole thing. And this building, just to the side here, you, oh, I've got it on the point of there, isn't it? Um, which is on, it's called the Atlas Building. And you go around the world and everybody says, how's the Atlas Building doing? Because that was where the most powerful computer in the world used to be housed. And actually we have the ability to go back to punch tapes and things like that to read stuff. There. So that's that laboratory. And when I first went there, 7,000 users a year used to come onto that site. This is 40 minutes from Heathrow Airport. The plane would land, they'd get out, there would be a, a Mercedes taxi, even for students. Perish the thought. They came, we couldn't afford anything else. They came in, they came in the front gate, they were given their dinner tickets, their accommodation, and 20 minutes later they were on beam line. Because that, the, the, the uh, neutron source down the bottom here, ran for 120 days a year. And the electricity bill when I was leaving was 12 million pounds. So it's £100,000 a day to run. You cannot have people hanging around eating their sandwiches. you just got to go on. So that's how that worked. Nowadays, the numbers going there have dropped to 2000 a year. Not because they don't use it. Now they use it even more. They're accessing it remotely. And so biologists would count, account for about 40% of what's going on in the synchrotron, 30 to 40%. And environmental sciences are big bigger users than physicists and material scientists like myself. They don't even turn up ever. They send their samples by FedEx or whatever. They arrive in a duar at liquid nitrogen temperatures. A robot picks them up, puts them on beam, and the, uh, the x-rays come through because it's an x-ray source. Or we call it a light source because you can change the way you think. Uh, and um, the, 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 the spectra is taken. They're physicists, the modelers there. They do all the analysis and the, uh, the, uh, the experimenter in their university office gets the picture back on their screen and the data on their screen. Now there are two or three things about that. One is they've had to trust a lot of other people en route. They know nothing about how the experiment really works. They've got to trust the equipment and they've got the results. At the same time they've got to protect those results and that's the reason for the data store. Because, uh, and as I'll point out, we had to have four people all the time protecting the firewall because we had, now just listen to this, 50 million hits a day on our firewall to distort the data. And if the data from one of those uh, structural biology experiments had been twisted around or coordinates changed or the, uh, the opposite polarization and a drug company took those data and used it for a field test uh, and we had thalidomide on our hands or something similar, who is legally responsible? And the grant is with the university, not with us. It's the university that's responsible. How are they going to deal with it? So these are the sort of issues that were coming out of this sort of environment. And they're increasing more and more. And you can see what happens. You don't need to know anything about diffraction. Great if you did, because it's fun. At least I think it's fun. Uh, and here's a sort of mythical structure down the bottom here. Uh, and you can do your neutron diffraction. Actually, if you want to do it now, you do it in Oak Ridge, um, uh, Tennessee. Uh, in my old laboratory in Imperial College, we have a dark fiber straight across to Georgia Tech and through that to the neutron diffraction source, so you can operate that equipment in real time from London. The X-ray diffraction uh, is the better synchrotron is in, in Grenoble, so you have that done down there, again remotely. And in the old days when I was around, uh, your NMR went to your nuclear magnetic resonance measurements were done in Tokyo, just outside Tokyo. And you never had, as I used to joke, my son never had to leave his bedroom to do it. So this is the environment which is now, is now and is going and getting more and more. This is what e-science does for you. So integration of data and publications. So this is what I mean by research infrastructure. They're dispersed equipments that are, have to be managed uh, centrally. And the way you do that is, in, is vital if you're going to actually make this type of environment work. There are physical infrastructures, and I'll come back to those as well. So what's going on in Europe over the last four or five years is that Groups have been getting together and starting to unify how they work together to share equipment, to share the e-science backbone, as it were, to make this happen. And here's a group looking at atmospheric properties around Europe, and you don't need to know who they are. They've all linked together in one common purpose to work together. 
And another group is the synchrotrons, there's the old uh, diamond again at the bottom there, a group of them, they are now working together, sharing experience, sharing wavelengths, sharing energy, so that we get the full spectrum of what's going on. And almost all of them are remotely taking more and more equipment, uh, samples remotely. Okay, so in 2006, I chaired this European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, and we, I thought there were just too many synchrotrons in, in Europe. I called it the synchrotron glut. And I stood up and said, we ought to have a roadmap for the next 20 years of what we need to build and how we're going to take it forward. And I insisted um, that we actually didn't just look at physical and engineering sciences, but we looked at biological, medical sciences, and arts and humanities as well. And after two years of uh, murder, mayhem, and other stuff that went on around Europe, we ended up with 35 projects which we thought were pan-European, open access, free at the point of access, and, and a number of other criteria. And they were over a certain size to make it worthwhile doing in the European model. It's been revised again, and there are now 44 projects on that file, of which 10 have started. And the one I'm proudest of, I'll talk about in a moment, is the X-ray free electron laser, and I'll show you what that's about later on. Okay, so here's some of the projects, because this might just open up your mind to what we're talking about. This is in the era of social sciences and humanities. There were originally five of them, and I'll show you what they are. European Social Science Data Archives. Okay, that's one. 20 social science data archives being brought together in one, in one co coherent whole uh, as a one-shop stop for uh, uh, access. Facts about it. The members hold 25,000 data sets and they deliver 70,000 data sets to about, now about 7,000 uh, individual researchers. So you can start to see this is starting even in social sciences to become fairly big. Uh, Daraya, as it's called, is about arts and humanities, bringing together um, heritage materials and preservation of um, things like uh, creative arts into a big package there. So that Daraya is underway already. Both those are going. European Social Survey, another one that's been going a little bit longer, and it's monitoring change in social values across the whole of Europe. 30 countries participating. Looking at ageing, health and retirement, and again, this is linked with the US Health and Retirement Study and our own UK Longitudinal Study of Ageing. Looking at the quality of life and how you actually develop policy for that across Europe. You're getting a hang, aren't you, now, of where we're coming from. This is my favourite project of the whole lot, is Clarin. Clarin was formulated by a cat called Steve Clarin, University of uh, uh, Utrecht. Uh, he's a medieval German scholar, uh, language scholar. And he got together with a load of other medieval language buffs and said, we need some sort of common um, repository which we can interrogate in a semantic way uh, uh, and see what words mean. Great, you say. Why is it so popular? It's popular because understanding what language means in context has far more impact than just in German medieval studies. It's about international law. It's about international treaties. What do words mean? And in fact, when our report came out, the next day, the Japanese, uh, Chinese, sorry, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Department of Energy in the States, the Chilean government and the Brazilian government all phoned up and said, we want to hear about Clarin because we understand what it will do for us in terms of international agreement. So what is it? It's a, a common language resource and it covers all countries in, in Europe and now much wider. This is an old slide. But there are challenges. There's technical challenges of how you bring them all together ensuring that all languages are, are, are there. So having common standards, so understanding what words mean in context. What, what does that contextually mean? And it's really very big challenges that are sorting out. Now the great thing about this is that this project is run not by the scholars themselves, the medieval scholars. This project is run by a plasma physicist based in the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in Nijmegen. And this is one of the secrets of what's happening now. Different disciplines are getting together and you use the expertise for what you want. And actually it's a new life for a lot of people in physics and in computing science getting involved in these projects and taking them forward. 
Obviously, you've got to convince the humanities people that they've got to get in there. And these are people who have not been traditionally part of it. But we've seen a movement now, again throughout Europe, that more and more people are saying, I'm going to lay down my dusty books and get involved in this type of project. And they have little tradition in using these tools. Again, it's like the biologists. They have to trust these other people. Um, and making people aware of what the benefits are. And so I say to them, do you mind me selling this in a completely different way to where you started from? They say, no, no, as long as we've got the money, you know, we can do our thing. Great, so we get on with this, and this is really a very popular one. And then, in all these projects, though, that there are big legal challenges about the intellectual property right, about it's my data and I'm not going to let go of it, and so on. And making it easy for people to get in under a com, uh, common comms uh, way of doing it making sure, too, that privacy and ethical issues are put to one side. So anything to do with medical, uh, personal medical records, for instance, has to be taken out. Okay, in environmental sciences, we had a number of projects here. These are some of them that are there. And the one I want to talk about is my favorite in here, and I talked to uh, a couple of people this morning about this one, is LifeWatch, large-scale e-infrastructures for biodiversity research. Run out of the University of Amsterdam by Walter Loss. And he says, look, we, oops, oh, well, never mind. The, the system is so complicated and so complex, you cannot just look at individual components. You've got to look at the system as a whole. And they all interface with each other. Experimentation on a few parameters is not enough. And you cannot just scale up from a small pilot study. You've actually got to look at the whole Earth. And you bring this lot together, and in doing so, you start to inform policy makers in what they should do. Okay, well... You can take stuff that's already captured, whether it's ecological monitoring sites, things bobbing around in the ocean, uh, greenhouse gas measurements, looking at plate tectonics, or even butterfly and bug collections in, uh, in museums, but also in this, um, commercial aircraft picking up data as they fly across the world, um, and, and also to now increasingly, I'm trying to find it, am I going to, no I'm not, I'm going to have it here, this thing the mobile telephone with a camera attached. Okay, you see a bug in the field you've not seen before, click, apps, it's got your coordinates, and increasingly it will have your, uh, some data about temperature and humidity and other stuff. Click on there. European satellites are already programmed to receive those data, and they send them down to CERN, because they're the experts in data analysis. The simulations are done up in Finland up here, because it's cold and they've got a lot of hydroelectric power. And then that analysis all comes back to the person with the telephone if they want to use it. And I joked with Walter Loss, I said, that's going to be great. He said, it's not going to be great, it's happening now. And it does open up the whole area of citizen cyber science. How does anybody, anybody, can actually now take part in this research program, including people who have not got the resources that you've got or I've got, which are, you know, by all intents and purposes worldwide, really rather special. So how's it done? Well, there's somebody comes and we collect the data in many different ways. It's analyzed, as I said, in CERN and, uh, and people who know what they're doing. Well, hopefully. Um, and we develop a way for uh, getting hold of it and uh, interrogating it. And it comes back to the users who interrogate it and use it and develop policies as a result of it. So this has to be properly managed, because any one of these things going wrong means that the whole project goes wrong and the policy, whatever it may be, may be flawed. And the other thing about this is it's now linking in with other big projects. Elixir is probably the biggest project on the roadmap in terms of the amount of data that will come out of it. But then you've got about carbon observation, marine um, and biological observations, uh, and, uh, and other things too. And they're all starting to interlink and manage together. I run courses called Realizing and Managing International Research Infrastructures. And we have all this lot together, looking at common legal platforms, common access platforms as well. It's getting really very, very exciting. Well, this is the project I was mainly involved with and I'm still uh, keeping a watchful eye on. This is a project uh, for the next generation of X-ray sources in the world, and it's called the X-ray Free Electron Laser. Uh, and it's going to be, well, it is being built now, involving 12 countries, costing 1.2 billion euros. Uh, and I was chairing the group bringing it all together, which is rather 
exciting, especially with Russia, um, but, and China are involved as well. That's how it works, uh, for those of you who would like to know these things. It's basically a dirty long electron accelerator, firing electrons. You put them through magnets where they wiggle, and as they wiggle, they give out photons or X-rays. And uh, then, you, then you do certain things with them uh, to develop the, 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 the nature of the beam, and you zap your sample, dead easy. It's just three and a half kilometers long um, in a straight line. And just last week, the tunnel, the long tunnel, uh, was finally finished. So I had a celebration as well. And this is a long tunnel. It's 15 meters underground. And right at the end, you have um, here the, um, where, the, where, where the experiments are taken. So that's from the center of Hamburg out to Schnell, uh, something um, in Schnellsdruck Holstein uh, and uh, very easy to do. Of course, you have to convince all the houses on the, on the way they're not going to irradiate them. You have to tell them that they're not going to sink into the pit. And by the way, the x-rays at the end here are totally harmless. Ha ha. Um, so uh, why do we do it? Well, again, you don't need to know much about x-rays, although I know there's one person in the audience that does. Well, these, these are the generation of x-ray sources we have at the moment coming from the normal synchrotrons. And again, you don't need to know what these numbers mean, but the key is what the time resolution is down here. So you're down here at 100 picoseconds time resolution and this sort of intensity. And when we move to the new ones, we're at a billion times brighter than anything that exists. But more importantly, you're down at a 10 femtosecond time resolution. That may mean nothing to you. It's a million billionth of a second. Okay? And that's the time it takes an atom to move from one site to the other. So suddenly we have an atomic movie camera. Rather than having a static camera, which didn't have atomic resolution, we now can see atoms and atoms moving together and interacting. It means you can take a membrane protein, which you can't crystallize here, you can take a drug here and see them operating atom by atom in real time. Isn't that fantastic? I think so. And the first time I heard it, which was back in 2020, uh, 2010, no, 2000, well, wherever we are, 2000, uh, it was to do with some big... Um, uh, plasma physics experiment. They said, by the way, there's this little line off to the side. I said, I, that's what I want. That's what I want. I phoned up the minister then, David Sainsbury, our minister for science and uh, innovation at that time. I said, this is fantastic. We've got to go for it. I said, by the way, I ought to tell you, it's never been built and the theory is a bit dodgy. And there's a 50% chance it might not work. Ah! <laughs> I said, but if it does work, it revolutionizes pharmaceutical sciences and biology and even my own field. Um, and it will certainly uh, change environmental sciences. So, and this was the reason it was um, controversial, because this was the modeling that was done on a single um, enzyme. Did you get the information out of it before you destroyed the sample? And my wife used to say, it's like being shot by your friend and smiling at them before you're dead. Uh, and, and the question is, could you get the information out? Because you're always, with the power at 17.5 GeV, the power that was going to go in there was going to destroy anything. Uh, and, it went, yeah, and everybody discussed it, and there was arguments. Unfortunately, one of my council members didn't accept it, and we had a bit of an argument, and he was the director of the Laboratory for Molecular Biology. It was a bit unfortunate. Um, but we sat with it and thought, well, let's go. And some of the early results from prototypes showed that it pos was possible. Great thing... Those of you that read Nature, Nature, February this year, the first experiments, not on this particular machine, but on the American equivalent, came through to show it was possible. What a relief. Ten years and spending 1.2 billion euros. Oh gosh, at least it works. <laughs> uh, I never lost any sleep at all. <laughs> um, and this was the first paper to show that you could do it on a single, uh, uh, single protein. And also then looking at virus particles. Uh, single mini, vi mini virus particles intercepted an image with an X-ray laser. Wonderful news. I must admit, these guys deserve a Nobel Prize. Okay, but what are the big challenges? Well, this is one of the detectors. And this, and this one of seven. And you can just see at the bottom here, this will operate uh, at 10 gigabytes per second for one of them. That's rather a lot of data. And if you accumulate that over a year, you end up with... 20 petabytes of data, uh, 200 petabytes of data a year. Now, most people haven't a clue what a petabyte of data looks like. I'm not going to take a straw poll because I can pretty much guarantee that you don't. Uh, a petabyte of data, if it's on CDs, is a kilometer high of CDs. So this is 200 kilometers high of CDs a year. 
Now, unlike when it comes to CERN, where they think they know what they're looking for and can get rid of most of the data, nobody has any idea what they're looking for, so they have to capture this. This analysis actually was done by the data scientists at CERN. And that's a tall order to be able to take that amount of data and actually store it so you can interrogate it later. Because you can't do it in real time, by the way, if it's operating in a million billion per second. You can't say, hang on a moment, I'm going to do the knob. So the simulations running the experiments. And again, these are for biologists who won't be there. These are, they're, they're handing their, a lot of the bits of the chain over the people they've just got to trust. So the whole interconnectivity now uh, of the networks uh, are vital to getting this sort of thing to work. And this is the, the network in Europe, it's called Géant, on Géant 2, as we're now seeing. And we're upgrading in the UK to 40 gigs. And this is what it looks like globally. And I did have a slide which only stopped in Australia, and I couldn't see how it how it moved over to New Zealand. I do need a slide that shows me how, how you link in. But we're seeing linkages now into, East, into India and into uh, Southern Africa and elsewhere. They're all linking up together. And as I said, in Imperial, I could operate equipment in real time in America without having to leave. And this is happening more and more. And people like the Chinese are really getting into this and the Koreans as well really vital and the project that you may know about the square kilometer array which may or may not be in Australia or New Zealand or in southern Africa depends on this sort of structure in order to get going because you can't the, the, the scientists won't be on each uh, individual radio telescope dish they will be wherever they are okay and out of this I was in, in Qatar of all places and I suddenly saw this headline in the Qatari newspaper data is the new oil expert and I have no idea who this expert is but actually I thought it's quite potent <coughs> coming from the Middle East that actually they're starting to see what the value of all this is and in nature a couple of years ago data sh shameful neglect research cannot flourish if data is not preserved and made accessible all concerned must act accordingly and then a little earlier big data the next Google and so the example I know best about is that of CERN. And I thought you might like to see the snowy landscape because it may make you feel at home. Um, okay, and as you know, this is a whole bunch of people around the world. And actually CERN was created for political reasons, not for scientific reasons, to try and bring peace to Europe 50 odd years ago. And this is the experiment that's going on at the moment, the Large Hadron Collider, where you basically have a, a, a proton and an antiproton, and you bash them together and a lot of energy comes out. And you hope something happens. And indeed, in the last week or two, the thing that they've been looking for is what gives mass to particles, the so-called Higgs field or Higgs boson. And there is indication that around about 140 gigaelectron volts, they say we see extraneous results. That's as far as you get, because it takes some years to build up enough statistical data to know what you're seeing. And this links, too, with the Teratron in, uh, in a Fermilab in the States, who shut down just as they were starting to see something happening. Gosh, poor guys having to shut down at the moment that something might happen. Whether anything's there or not is another matter. Years ago, my daughter, when she was about 14 or 15, asked the head of particle physics at my lab, what happens if you don't find anything? He said, really embarrassing. But there'll be new physics. <laughs> but look at the bottom there. One event is 1.5 megabytes. Take that away and look at the number of... This is another detector, the so-called compact neuron solenoid. And you can see just there the size of a person. So you see how big it is. But if you just take all the data out, you get one petabyte per second. Don't forget I said that the other one was 200 petabytes a year. This is one petabyte per second. If all three detectors dump all their data onto the World Wide Web, it dies in 10, in, in 10 seconds. And they've got every right to do it. They invented the World Wide Web. Why shouldn't they do it? They're very responsible people. So they take out 99.9% .9 of the data in the first two microseconds. Why the first two microseconds? That's the time it takes for particles to get from the middle to the outside. And I had 20 people working there, getting down from one petabyte to three gigabytes in two microseconds. The reason they can do it is they think they know what they're looking for. And it says down here, event selection is based on the physics model. But it may be wrong, and they may be missing something. Oh, trapped. Uh, we've got to do it all again. Um, so that's going strong at the moment, and we're, we're, we're excited about the results. It's only on half power at the moment. 
uh, and it will go up to full power fairly soon. But this is the sort of data flow models, and they are looking for one good result in however many noughts that is. It's uh, 10 billion billion, isn't it? Uh, snapshot results. Really very difficult. It's a real needle in a haystack job. So they, they're guessing what they're looking for and taking it out. This is all the hardware that's needed and lots of banks of stuff. There's five banks of computers to take out those data. But it, having done all that, they end up with 10 petabytes of raw data a year. Peanuts, you say. Peanuts. T 10 kilometers high of data. No, well, that doubles by the time they actually do some simulations. That then all gets sent to tier one centers around the world, of which Rutherford was one. And by the time you've actually done a bit more processing, you're up to 50 petabytes data. Small beer. Small bit. Okay, but at least they have been modeling this and uh, field uh, testing it for the last five, six, seven years. So they know what's going on. That's why you use these people for data analysis, not some person who's just sitting in the lab with a, the, the old computer. Go to the people who know what they're talking about. Going on a bit though, with all this going on, how is the poor old student going to operate? Here's the poor student with rest. I would say there's a Microsoft slide. It's plagiarized from them. Most of these slides are plagiarized from somebody or other. All sorts of information is coming into them. How do they know it's true? How do they manipulate it? How do they interrogate it? How do they organize it? Big questions. And one of the key things I'm trying to do at the moment is get academics to realize they've got to train students in this environment. And most academics don't know how to do it because um, Whilst you can look at the bit of data that you've got, there's so much more underneath it. And how can you make it ready for reuse and reinterrogation? And so this is another Microsoft slide. Is what sort of things do you need to do to the data to make sure it is reusable? Because my data is my data, and I'm not letting it go, mate. Okay, so the big issues are, the biggest issue is actually how you call the wretched data store. Uh, the American data store in Oak Ridge, they're having to build a separate substation 50 megawatt substation to cool the, the, the data. That's why you put these things up. Well, actually, you'll be pretty good down here. It's pretty cold. Pop it in Antarctica. Um, as long as you've got some hydroelectric power from somewhere, you can get on with it. But this is a killer for universities. We ran out of power in central London to cool our data store. Okay? Who looks after it when you've moved on and you've linked your data to the e-publications? And I can tell you the contracts between in the UK and in Europe between the, the grant giving body and the university says you have to keep that data available for the rest of its time. If you don't, you are legally liable. Data terrorism. I talked about 50 million hits a day on our firewall. I bet you most universities are not able to cope with that. How do you get nations to agree on working together? especially a rather large nation slightly north of here, um, how do you actually train people in managing these uh, data sets? How do you police the data management plans? Again, in the UK and elsewhere, uh, especially in the States, you don't get your grant unless you have a robust data management plan, and you don't get the last payment unless you show it working. Okay? Um, what happens in the long term? And of course, none of us want to share. Uh, now, turning to the European research area board, we moved into this space about um, three and a half years ago. I thought I'd just show you who they are. Um, well, there's obviously me. Um, this is the commissioner, Janusz Potocznik, at the back here. Um, this guy here is Alain Pompidou from France, uh, president of the French Academy of Engineering and uh, until recently head of the European Patent Office. Uh, just at the back here, Jeanne van der Beesen, who is technical director of Philips Worldwide. Lady here, Maria Markovov, the chief executive of the European Science Foundation. Uh, Gail Winkler here, rector of um, Vienna University. Uh, Nukit Bieltis, uh, head of Tubitak, the Turkish research agency. Reinhold Atch up here, who is technical director of Siemens Worldwide. Um, Frank Gannon, who is now in Brisbane, but used to be head of the European Molecular Biology Organization. Uh, Jan Botti, who is head of uh, technology at EDF. Barbara Helling, who used to be a minister in the uh, Swiss government. And Robert Amar, who used to be director general of, uh, of CERN. There's one person missing, who's David King, who used to be my, my prime minister's chief scientific officer. So you see the sort of people that are there. And one thing we said earlier on is we don't want any officials in our meetings, because you want our advice. 
And so we came up uh, just almost two years ago with what our advice would look like. And we called it Preparing Europe for a New Renaissance, a strategic, a strategic view of the European research area. And in it, Janusz Potocnik wrote this, it's about holistic thinking and an approach which epitomizes the first renaissance. But with this privilege was the domain, the, 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 was the domain of the few in the first renaissance. It now becomes the domain of citizens, the expectation of all citizens in the field of science, uh, research and innovation. And we came up with six strategies and 35 uh, recommendations. But the key one here is that the, era, the European research area is driven by the need to address the cha uh, grand challenges and being involved in policy society in a jointly responsible way. Okay, now we came up with these recommendations. I, I won't go through them, but the key things in here, in the first one, looking at people to move freely around and mobility to share ideas, was in the area of coordination of scientific research to at least 10% of funding and also to increase mobility to at least 20% of doctoral students to move around the world. And hearing about your joint master's degree program this morning, this is the sort of area where we want to see more and more activity. Driven, driven by societal problems. Again here, we start to see about 30% of scientists, including humanities and social scientists, are trained in these fields of solving the grand challenges. The tools of e-science are deployed throughout, permitting international collaboration, so that all researchers will see themselves as part of the global research system. So this isn't just about little Europe, this is about the global environment. And I just, I've just picked out a few here. The one at the bottom I, I like, because we are moving to the area where we have to trust people. We really do have to trust people. We may not even see, and they'll be in different disciplines. So a universal code of scientific ethics about responsibilities and rights, engaging social responsibilities, as well as protecting intellectual freedoms. So that's another area which I think is very important. We get right at this stage. And we talk about a European research passport which tells you that you've signed up to what would be a Hippocratic Oath of doctors but for other researchers that you agree to certain values. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we did start late. And uh, um, so we looked at what it would look in 2030, globalization, virtualization and grand challenges. And by the way, we said at the moment, our policy regime, policy system is not uh, uh, right for this. We produce uh, the second report, we're saying, how do you do it? You don't need to know that, but because uh, those are internal to us. But the key was here, how do we go global? How do we get decisions in this environment to be uh, taken forward? And I'm glad to say there's a group of um, three areas of the world now meeting, we'll start meeting in South Africa in September, uh, looking at what sort of forum where these global decisions can be made. When I was in Australia earlier this week, they said, why aren't we involved? We want to be involved. I said, well, let's get the three groups that didn't agree even now to get their something together and come along later. And it's something you should start looking at because this is where the global decisions we made. We call it a, a Davos for research and development and innovation. We're not talking about Davos itself, but something similar to the World Economic Forum. Finally, and I'm going to have to whisk through this because uh, tea will be getting cold, uh, but we, we got to the project about now how do we deal with these data. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to rush here. I've obviously mumbled too much as we've gone along. Um, but basically, at the moment, our data environment in the middle here is in a total mess. Um, we've got lack of investment, we've got insufficient knowledge of how to do this, we've got fragmented data sets all over the place, nothing works and we don't have any skills. Great starting point. And it's one of, one of our strategic uh, agendas for uh, what Europe should look like in 2020. We've got to sort this lot out and so we're trying to do that at the moment. And I like this idea that we call this environment global collaboratories that actually totally new ways of doing research in this environment especially around those big problems. And the question we ask ourselves, what data do you actually have to store? What's personal? What's actually a more local community and so on? When does it become so valuable that you have to move into this regime and make sure that it's all done? So we look at that in this report, a hierarchy of uh, value. Now, I, I really can't spend much time on this, otherwise we, we will we'll die on ourselves, at least I will. But the, the data itself is not just something that floats around in the ether. It's now the infrastructure itself. So we have physical infrastructures, we have virtual ones, and now we have the data as uh, infrastructure itself. 
Okay, so I'm just, I'll just take the headlines here. There are eight visions. All countries are aware of this importance of doing something about it. And I was hearing about what New Zealand was doing today, which gave me a lot of confidence in doing this. But uh, anyway, don't look at that. Um, that researchers and practitioners from disciplines which are not the same can work together in this environment and that they can be, have confidence, they can trust the data that they're getting from other disciplines. Okay, you might look at that. Looking at board access, a framework of repositories to work to international standards to ensure that they're trustworthy. Okay, you know, I won't look at that part. Obviously you need funding and this is scares governments rigid. Um, but <coughs> but you have to link it to what the extra benefits are. And so we need to articulate those in a very real way. <coughs> Bringing in industry and enterprise, and again, I heard from New Zealand that you have already done this. Um, there's a marked suspicion of bringing in private industry, Microsoft, oh, sorry. Um, uh, and Googles and Amazons, who will do all this stuff for you. But if we can do this in a robust way, which doesn't make our data vulnerable to international takeovers and things like that, then that should be looked at. Um, and then this is the big one, public access. Not those of who privileged people who are in universities. No, but anybody can access. And it's the whole area of cyber democracy. How do you educate the public to use this information responsibly? Especially journalists who can get a scare campaign going within milliseconds if they abuse data. And we had a meeting in the Wellcome Trust just before Christmas where somebody got up and said, can we really trust the public with these data? And I thought censorship straight away is going to be open. And so you've got to make your data available so it can be interrogated in a meaningful way, but not in the wrong way. It's going to be interesting. As you probably know, there's uh, things called Galaxy Zoo. Anybody taking part in Galaxy Zoo? Well, this is um, in people around the world who access the Hubble telescope. 50% of the comets have been discovered by non-professional astronomers now. And as the James Webb goes up, which will replace the Hubble even more. Uh, interesting. It's a different environment in which we've been working. Uh, again, linking solid evidence to policy. And again, in, in Europe, we have something called the Internet Foundation, which is actually looking at this whole issue, because these decisions will have worldwide ramifications. So I'm, I'm missing all this. Like and global governance is needed in order to, to, to make this happen. OK, so that's the eight visions. And what it is, just in summary, is here's your researchers down here in separate disciplines, chugging away in physical chemistry or whatever they're doing. They're mixing now in bigger groups around the world, maybe in climatology, environmental sciences, and other things. And at the top here, they're interfacing with a whole host of different disciplines because they don't realize in the cloud and in, in, in other areas that they're actually working with totally disparate groups. So researchers in different areas are interfacing uh, without necessarily knowing about it. And the question is, what do you, as a research um, supporters, have to provide to support all this lot? And now on the outside, you've got what's called grey literature, which you, isn't going through peer review. In fact, why bother to go through peer review? Because everybody can access this stuff and check it for themselves. Oh. Um, but, um, yes, doesn't it get you? You do the work, you do the peer review, and then you have to pay to get it. This is going to go. Uh, and the publishers are getting increasingly worried about this model. That's why uh, things like Scopus and other things are being developed very quickly. But what needs to be done? Well, you need to be able to authenticate and give security. You need to be able to give persistent storage. You need to have the computing infrastructure to be able to do it. You need personal identifiers. So you, Rupert Tipples of Lincoln University, are Rupert Tipples of Lincoln University, not mm -mm or mm -mm university trying to pretend to be you. And it's happening. Plagiarism is happening in a big way, and people are abusing people's names and other things. So the whole area of uh, unique personal identifiers is uh, absolutely critical of this. There are worries of sort of brave new world at the back of my mind as well, which we have to look at. Uh, I won't look at that. So this is the final slide. This is going to be very exciting. Many of you won't take part in it. You'll be chugging away in your own little ditches. Great for you. But for some of us, this is where the world is really about. And I actually believe it's absolutely imperative for future generations that we do something about it. So that's where little old Europe is coming from. Little old Europe is actually talking to America. And little old Europe is talking to China. 
and little old Europe is talking to quite a few other people. But let's let make it all happen together because it's going to be really exciting. I'm really excited. I wish I was starting research again. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, if they want. Right, we'll take some questions if anyone would like to ask questions uh, in open session now. Well, one of the uh, pushes in, in a university such as this in the last 10 years has been to look more carefully into our intellectual property. Uh, how, how do you deal with issues like this when you're trying to, in effect, to, uh, to, to open up that? Well, why are you trying to protect your intellectual property? Why on earth are you trying to protect it? Because you're not going to make any money out of it. I'm talking about the university. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Some financial advantage uh, as a scientist. Show, uh, show me your... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Opposed to it. I, I mean, I've got 19 patents. No, sorry, 17 patents. I've never made a penny. Not as anybody else. Okay? I know no university in the world that's actually managed to make a significant profit out of IPR. Why bother? In Europe, we have this concept now of what's called the fifth freedom. Everybody, uh, there, uh, there is freedom, ac freedom of access to all publicly funded information, that's publicly funded research. Now, IPR can be a big biggie, but the number is minuscule. And you should ask yourself as a university, when is it really worth it? Uh, I mean, I, it's not for me to say. Well, I, I would ask I, you that I, question. We're on the same wavelength, but, uh, I'm not going to say anything to your vice chancellor. It's up to you because there is this absolute thing. We've got to protect our IPR. But actually, when you come down to it, wouldn't it be better to let it go out freely and actually work with people so you can actually do something significant? And are you saying that in Europe you, 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 you won't come these No, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> It's, it's always mentioned and every throws a wobbly. That was the big problem I had with the X-ray free electron laser. The Russians wanted to have total, uh, wanted to have all the IPR that they were going to give to all their companies free of charge. And we said, well, it, you can give it to the companies, but the royalties have got to come back to the, to the thing. That can be done, because that can be done outside an IPR agreement. You can get a, a payback period for knowledge. Um, I mean, I'll tell you freely, Imperial College floated its technology transfer company on the London Stock Exchange has 51% of the shares. Imperial College borrows against the intellectual assets of that company to fund its research to the tune when I left of 70 million pounds a year. That is high risk, very high risk. Uh, and that's the way a lot of universities are going. But there is this belief, uh, I'm an, uh, I, I'll probably be totally shot by everybody, but there is this belief that you can make real money out of it. My own old University of Nottingham, we had the um, patent rights on NMR and MRI machines. We did make a lot of money out of that, but it never offset the money we spent on all the other dud jobs that we put up. <laughs> well, we did have the everlasting tomato. Uh, unfortunately, the gen uh, GM fiasco blew up the day we were going to sign it with a supermarket chain, so that never got anywhere. Right, another one. Yeah. A, some, yeah, it's um, a fun, yes. That, uh, that was great, um, uh, John. Just fantastic. Just a pun. Was just um, responding to the last comment, which was uh, over the next few weeks um, we're going to um, be debating in the university whether Lincoln uh, becomes an open access campus, mm. and, and so uh, that um, for those uh, who want to talk a lot about that and what it means in terms of open data, um, it, it's a debate we should have. Um, so you, you visit very timely. But it seems to me that it's a real policy lag, or I don't know whether to call it a policy lag or not, but, you know, in, in most countries, and certainly in the case of New Zealand, I mean, most academics in this room have been, um, you know, bleeding over the last few weeks over um, a, an antiquated system of how we reward and understand scholarship, old paradigms of scholarly communication. In the New Zealand context, we're talking about the PBRF, performance-based research funding, so it's based on um, um, authoritative journals from an old world. When, uh, but so, I mean, my question is, are, are you seeing anywhere in the world where the policy framework around academia and scholarship and scholarly communication is actually um, syncing with the collaborative um, and global world that you've been talking about? 
Uh, the answer is no. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, the reason is the accountants and penny pinchers in your treasuries and finance houses, that's how they operate. Uh, uh, and rather than looking at this bigger picture of what the intellectual value is. And one of the things we've been looking at, and I'm an advisor to the European Investment Bank, is not as just what the financial return is, but also what is the societal return on an investment. And I think where we've missed out is we've actually just gone along with these account sorry about accountants. Um, I mean, we, we, we had in the research council when I was there, we were given 95 metrics, including the citation per pound as being a metric. I mean, how, how depressing is that? Uh, I pointed out that the citation per pound should, uh, should go, uh, the, it, it, it should cost more and more. And they said, no, it should cost less and less. And I said, no, no, it should cost more and more because you should be pumping money into things that are good. Uh, why on earth we have this fixation with citations, I don't know. Um, when I, what you didn't see in that report was one of the main um, uh, strands is the whole area of open innovation. Publicly funded information is publicly available. How you use it is more important. Uh, Alan Lawson, the ex-finance minister of Sweden, says that. He says, knowledge is not about keeping it to yourself. Knowledge is how you use it. And he said, just putting it in a box is no use to anybody. But so we need to look at other ways. And I think an enlightened university would look at other ways. The other thing, too, is, uh, again, I was talking a little bit about this this morning, the World Bank, their tertiary education sector, talk about the I professor now being a sort of virtual professor that moves around. We've been talking too about the, um, what do they call it, not floating professor, um, but somebody who is linked, to, well as I am, to several universities and, and does a bit here and a bit here. And, and um, uh, again, the scenario we were talking about is where you come into global collaboratories and you, your, your intellectual uh, input is measured on your input to those, not on what comes out of a paper. But we're gonna, ha I mean, it is going the other way, Penny, I'm afraid, because it's easy to measure. But it, for me, stagnates things and makes life difficult. Um, I could go on at length, actually, but uh, I, I agree with you that we, we do need to... But what we do need is models that actually get around the problem, not, not just saying poor old does, because that won't wash it. It's, it's, it's so easy for the bean counters to, to take this approach. Okay, another one. No more? Everyone's keen to have their cup of afternoon tea. Well, afternoon tea is being served out in the foyer. Please do have one. Um, and uh, carry on with the discussion there. And I'm sure John will be willing to be approached personally if anyone wants to uh, ask more uh, personal nature questions. Thank you very much. And just be careful who you're best man to. <laughs> <laughs>